there are five elements in a psychodrama, right? There's the stage. Psychodrama uses space. It's very important to understand that space is part of the therapeutic milieu. Distance from size relationship, you saw it in here. How close, how far. What are their physicalizations? So Valerie taking different poses. Um, so it's space. The protagonist, the director, the auxiliary egos, the audience, and the stage. Those are the elements. Um, can we, do you want to be the protagonist for a moment? Um, so let's just see what that looks like. We choose a protagonist. The protagonist has a story they want to, they want to play out. The protagonist's responsibility is to show up and play that out. And you need to hold your protagonist to that contract. That if they have the stage, they show up and it is their responsibility to meet that moment. The protagonist chooses the auxiliaries. The director doesn't do that. And the protagonist chooses based on tailoring, based on connection. And if the protagonist looks around for ages, the protagonist looks around for ages. But you learn a lot in that choosing process. We did in our earlier psychodrama. I don't feel trusting enough. A lot comes out if you let that choosing process play itself out. Um, so would you like to choose an auxiliary or two just for demonstration? Sure. And you see in Valerie, the, the Valerie knows full well, we're not moving this into a psychiatrist, I mean, she knows exactly that it's training. Did you still warm up when you chose, right? Mm -hmm. And you chill, did you choose some roles in your head? I didn't choose roles in my head, but I just, I did want to go with Tele, just one yeah. like, who felt like the person, the right yeah. person. Yeah, there's a real thing at play in this choosing. Yeah. So here we have our, our director, our protagonist, our auxiliary egos, our stage, and our audience or group. These are always present in a psychodrama. And what were the dynamics within the psychodrama, the two I use the most are role reversal and doubling. If you really understand, and you did a lot of work with that this morning, right? Because you really were getting that. If you really understand the importance of role reversal and doubling, the rest will fall into place. But when you reverse roles, you'll use this language as a director, reverse roles. You know, don't switch roles, change roles, reverse roles. So your protagonist always knows what they're doing. Reverse roles and just show that, demonstrate that actually physically change places. And now you want to help train your clients to understand they have just reversed roles. You are now Valerie. You think, feel, and act like Valerie. And you are now uh, the role you chose. Ryan to play. Um, if it's Valerie's brother or lover or whatever, father. Um, and you don't mix that up. If, you're, if your role players start getting mixed up, you, you remind them you're, you're playing your brother, you're playing Valerie's brother, you're playing Valerie. And then the job of, of this, auxiliary, this auxiliary is to approximate the role that he's called upon to play. Right now he's called upon to play Valerie. Maybe in the other he's called upon to play Valerie's brother. Okay. Um, and that and they they come up with the feelings that would be appropriate to that person, always taking their lead from the protagonist. Because if they start making up too much, it stops, to, it stops being values drama. So reverse roles. And as, as you see, the way I direct is I don't invite endless uh, making up. Because the danger in that is that our protagonist will just say, OK, well, maybe that's, you know, it gets too far. This is her show. It's her life. It's her drama. So it should all issue for her, and you are always working off this. And if you've got somebody who's just going crazy with role playing, bring them back 
to, to make sure. And one way you can bring them back without maybe shaming them is, does that feel right to you? Would, would mom act like that? Would, would brother act like that? And if you say, yes, it's perfect, I'll let it alone. And, and think maybe the auxiliary has the inside line. Because as the director, I don't have that. The auxiliary sometimes really picks stuff up. But if you have Valerie and you say, no, no, that's not right. So I'll say then, reverse roles and show us. So let's do that, reverse roles. And show us your brother. And then this will be role training. And I'll say, got that? OK, reverse roles. So you can train people without embarrassing them, but you want to keep them to the, to the integrity of the scene. Um, doubling, we double for the protagonist or the protagonist in any other role. Generally, it's not thought of as good psycho classical psychodrama to double for the roles. Sometimes I do it, sometimes it's irresistible, sometimes it's right on the money, so I let it go. But generally speaking, the, the truer way is to stick with the protagonist or the protagonist in role reversals, because if, say, Valerie's here, and there's a double for this role and double for this, she's going to start getting disoriented and it's feel ganged up by It's too much. It needs to be her drama. This is her work. My first loyalty is to the protagonist. And so I'm, I'm, the only, I'm her best line of defense. If I don't keep this pure and for her, nobody's going to. So this is where I belong. Um, I double a lot in my directing style just because I like to. And I find, it, I find it a more direct line to joining the protagonist. I find it a more uh, effective way of, of saying things without, without saying them from here where I might uh, get in a way, I say them from here. And it's my interpretation. This is how I, my interpretation as the therapist or director goes into how I double and how, what scenes I help her. I mean, we always follow the lead of the protagonist. I don't walk in the room and say, yeah, I'd like to do your this work today. I don't do that. I let the group warm up, we do warm ups, and then what work work is popping up for you? And in trauma work, this is particularly important. Go with the warm up of the client. Work with somebody who's warmed up. We worked with three people who were warmed up. And it made the work easier for them, and easier for the group. Because this is hard work. The frozenness you see in this work is typical of trauma work. I can tell you there's no place I've gone in the country that this doesn't happen. And the more I get known and paid for trauma, the more I encounter frozenness. And so if anybody's got great ways of dealing with it, let me know. But so far, my way is to understand it's frozenness, to understand it's the, the, the idea with a traumatized person is that their work is fragmented. It gets shut down or fragmented, or there is feeling is this split off, they dissociate. So the double is bringing the protagonist slowly to the threshold of their own feeling. Now, once they catch it, the, you let it go. And that's why when I invite you to double, and I hope we'll do it more in the next couple of days, jump up and double. The, the only kind of doubling you don't, you don't want to do, and this happens sometimes, is people think of a great double, and then they don't do it. And then they come in. You know, like a couple minutes later, with the and it's like a badly dubbed movie. You know, like, oh, you know that fit before, but so jump up and get it. Strike while the iron is hot. The other thing is to do. It isn't nobody's doing this in this group at all, but sometimes groups, you'll, somebody will come up to double and they'll think about it, and they'll walk around and they'll. And they'll just keep thinking, and then they'll stand for a while, and then they'll walk, and then everybody's just nerve-wracked by the time they finally get around. And the protagonist has to kind of deal with this presence on the stage that feels humongous. So just easy in, easy out, and then sit down. Um, some people have a double stay with the protagonist. I don't. I want, I want it, everything. I want them to be autonomous. And because I stay with the protagonist so closely, I don't also. Uh, but they're, but everybody's got their own directing style, and they're all fine. You know, this is having to be mine. Um, so we did role reversal, we did doubling. The next thing we saw earlier with you, it was the soliloquy, the walk and talk soliloquy. That's an, uh, but remember, role reversal and 
doubling on the core. That's going to be potatoes. If you want to get do some more stuff, the soliloquy is wonderful. And you did it wonderfully. It's just an inner, it's, it's, that, it's that Hamlet soliloquy. You know, it's the inner world. And it's a lovely moment on stage if someone can embrace it and just say what's going on. There's the interview. Now this, um, let's, let's Valerie reverse roles with your, one way I like to use the interview is you saw me do it in, in uh, your drama. Why do you think your mother, it, it, I interviewed your mother. Why do you think your daughter brought you here? Well, now we could do that a lot if it was, if, if, it, if Valerie were now playing her brother, I could have all kinds of fun with her saying, why do you, you know, what is it about you that your sister doesn't like, or why, why do you think of your sister? What, do you have any insight into why she's, you can say whatever you want. And Valerie in this role then can, can let herself um, say whatever she wants, say the family secrets from this role that you can't say from that role. All kinds of things can happen with this. Um, if it's, if, reverse roles, if Valerie were reversing into her mother's role or her father's role, that's, you know, that would have been a really good thing to do in yours, Marsha. If we had time and space, if I'd known it wasn't it was five thirty, but this is it. but it's perfect the way I you know you have to trust the press, but um, we could have interviewed your parents. You in your, the role of your parents. In fact, I would really encourage you to write journal entries as your parents, or letters from your parents back to you, or letters from your parents to their parents, or you know, get underneath the, what you carry inside as the interject. And that, that is, that's a, one thing that psychodrama allows you to play with so wonderfully, are the people we carry, we carry inside of us that we've interjected from our childhood. We, um, we get to break them out in psychodrama. We get to say, who, who could play your father? Who could play your mother? Who could play your older sister? All the people, I'm a youngest child. I've got interjected roles all over the place. I love playing them in psychodramas, and I wish someone would interview me endlessly you know, <laughs> in my family's role. I have endless things and volumes to say, and I have so much fun doing it. Um, so in the, the other big thing in psychodrama is concretize. This is what we're doing in psychotrauma. We are concretizing the issue. This is what you don't do in talk therapy. In talk therapy, you say, tell me about your trauma, and somebody goes, ah, you know, what? So the danger there, are you guys getting tired of standing? Um, the danger there is that, let, well, let's even look at that. Here's talk therapy. Somebody just come on up for a moment, will you? Anybody, I'm not going to, yeah. Okay, so. They just stick around. I know, because this is perfect. We'll see the contrast. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. You look at the psychodrama, and the psychodrama is, and I'll see actually where you were. It's perfect. Um, the psychodrama's ability to break the roles out and put them on a stage so that Valerie does not have to do that work. I'm, I'm doing it with her. With her. And I'm not asking her to talk about anything. We're gonna we're gonna encounter the, the we're gonna concretize this scene before we say, could you tell me about your trauma? I mean that can be a very tough thing for somebody who's traumatized to do. And sometimes people can be very fluid about it and really feel the feelings and articulate them, particularly if they've done enough of this. But the danger here is that somebody will tell a story about themselves without feeling. Because the life that, the healing, is when you can feel and think at the same time. Moving, feeling, thinking, and action should be integrated, coordinated, you know, have integrity. In, uh, but when we ask somebody to tell us a story, that's why sometimes people have, feel like I've done all this work, you know, that I don't, I, I, I don't nothing's changed. They've learned it to tell a great story about what happened to them, but they don't feel the feelings that surrounding them. So also, if people had their thinking mind shut down when they were experiencing these circumstances, they never made sense of it to begin with. 
So then when you say, kind of, tell me about it, and you, did they, then the danger is that they don't want to feel stupid, so they'll make something up that sounds right. Or, even worse, I'll tell them what I think happened, you know, about it all, and then they'll agree. Which is, so then I tra you know, that's codependency, that, you know. That's, I love psychodrama because of the autonomy. And you, you see with the protagonist a whole bunch of times, get it right or don't get it, did I get that right? Yes, that's very good. Did I get it right? It wasn't, you said that so clearly. It wasn't like that. that didn't, and you changed it. When it felt right, it felt right. When it felt wrong, it felt wrong. And that, I think, is much more fostering of autonomy. Um, not than one-to-one. -one. I also, I love one-to-one. -one. I think I believe in one-to-one. -one. So I don't mean in any way to put it down. I just think it works best in concert with psychodrama. And the, the other thing I want to emphasize is that, and those of you who were protagonists, I think could probably say yes to this, it's so large just to stand up and open your mouth and choose a role player. Don't worry if you don't have any enormous, don't push for big action, because sometimes trauma work is really quiet. You know, it, it, but you were working like crazy inside, on the inside. I think you were all working like crazy. Even if you were blocked, you were working like crazy. I mean, if to stand in, to be in front of people blocked is, is working like crazy. I think I remember maybe even in, I think it happened in onsite one time when I was uh, working, I was as working as a, a group leader, I think, for, or, or training or something like that, and they were, I think it was when Sharon Wichert had it, and they were doing a funeral scene, and somebody was um, <coughs> stretched out dead, a father, and, and I remember being, I was a professional at the time, so I didn't want to get too lost in my own feelings, but I remember thinking, how, how interesting that I feel nothing, you know, that, and I wasn't part of the scene, I was just uh, part of the witnesses, part of the audience, but how uh, that's really interesting, you know, my, I mean, I, Closed my own father's eyes. I was with him when he died. I was with a lot of trauma around his death. And I said, it's a really interesting that I just don't feel anything. I must be like completely healed. And then I thought, I don't feel anything. I feel nothing. <laughs> and I and and that it, that became interesting to me that I felt nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I adored my father. And then I thought, I wonder. Well, I don't think nothing is the right amount. <laughs> I, think, I think I would likely feel something. And I didn't think I have to be there in tears. I didn't have to be feeling a ton, but nothing. And that was the beginning of a lot of opening of my own of dealing with my father's death and the way he died. So nothing is great feedback. Um, I think, I think, did I, is there anything I'm not thinking of just right? Sort of mirror, but the, oh, that's a good idea. Thanks. Um, so the the mirror in psychotrauma works like this. If Valerie it needs some space from some distance from her own trauma scene, I can say, Valerie, could you choose someone to play you? Will you do that? For sure. Thank you. Okay. And then Valerie and I. Oops move out and we together as the in this case the director and the protagonist can look back at her scene this is really, this is really important in trauma work <laughs> um, so that um, and then, then now now we can look together now she's out of the scene and now you're using it almost as a sculpture and now, if there is, in psychodrama, we never talk about, it's always dynamic. You talk to, as, you. The then and there is a here and now, you, you keep it in the present. I try to do that as much as possible today. We slipped into past tense now and then, but usually we want to be just in present tense. But here, we can say, so what are you, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? What are you, let's walk around. Why, do, Valerie, do you want to mill through the scene? Why do, and I might inv invite Valerie, to walk around the scene and say to you, is there anybody you want to talk to? Or very often I'll say, what do you want to say to yourself in that scene? This is really the most illuminating maneuver, and easiest, actually. 
Um, because from here, Valerie can see how trapped she is and talk to herself. And then she can reverse roles and you want to do that? And talk from the child back to her adult self. And ultimately, this is the connection you want to strengthen for your client, is this inner dialogue. You want the, the adult to come back on board and be the one that the child, the traumatized child, talks to first. Because otherwise, the traumatized ch child talks to the world from here. And then wonders why the world doesn't understand or respond or want to take care of them. You know, but the world really doesn't want to. The world wants this child to be heard by the adult in, in this, the adult self and translate the needs into words and say them. And you see this in, in relationships so frequently. If, if you look at your partner and scream from the hurt, wounded place, first of all, there's a lot of transference involved because it's the wounded child. They weren't even around with the child. Uh, second of all, it, it blurts out. It just blurts out in these demands and these wounds that, you know, it just makes your partner feel like that, oh, I mean, I'll never, where do I start, you know? And I'm not your mother or your dad or whatever. Um, but when this adult can hear this part and then turn to the partner and say, here is what from this adult partner place I need to talk to you about, which is not to say it doesn't get heated, it doesn't get teary, it doesn't get angry, it doesn't get all that stuff but it doesn't get like bonkers, you know? So you have some hope of working it out. So, thank you. Um, let's, let's reverse back. I already want to be ending it. Yeah, reverse back. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, this would be, actually this would be the place I would end it from in a trauma scene. Um, because I would always end from the adult role. So if we had chosen a stand-in, I would, Say, uh, you know, say, end it any way you want to, Valerie. Say the last things you want to say, or reshape the family. That's a fun, that's, that's a cool thing to do in trauma work. Reshape them, and, and the protagonist will look at you and go, what? And you'll say, reshape them. How would you have liked it to be? And maybe they put so and so close, and so and so, you know, and this, this is autonomy. I, I can put, I'm going to be next to that person, that person, that. And you get it the way you wanted it, and then you can look at it, and then how does it feel? And this can actually be one of the most emotional moments because it's, it's hard to see what you wish you could have had all those years. But actually feeling the pain of that and letting in the new image is quite wonderful because then you know what you're going to look for next time.